So let me turn up the uh, phone link and we'll talk to her in just one second. Well, I'm Haynes Ely, and my intent today is to talk to Florinda Donner and try to bring as much of the sorcerer's world to the listener as possible in one hour. I'm going to let Florinda introduce herself. So I'm going to introduce myself? I'm going to ask you to tell us who you are and what you're going to do today. Oh, but actually, I really don't know what I'm going to do today. I think that, well, I am Florinda Donner. I'm an anthropologist. I've been working with Carlos Castaneda over 20 years. And as a student of anthropology, I was drawn into the world of sorcerers, and I have stayed there ever since. Well, the question that comes to mind right off the bat, Florinda, is the world of the sorcerers doesn't allow any volunteers. Well, it's not, no, not volunteers in the sense that, yes, I want to be in the world of the sorcerers. Of course, in a weird way, we have to be totally volunteers because nobody is drawn into this world against their will. However, and I don't know whether you, you, you know about it, we have been giving a series of lectures lately in bookstores, Di Chavilar and myself and, and Carol Tiggs. And that is the recurrent question, you see. What makes you so special or, what, I mean, nothing makes us so special. <laughs> we are truly, and I'm not saying this out of, you know, false humility, but we are very ordinary people. And in something, something very extraordinary has happened to us. The, the, the idea of this idea, okay, that there are no volunteers in the sense is, this world is an extremely arduous and solitary world. What we have noticed as we have been talking to different groups of people is most, I'm not saying all, but most of the people have, are used to having, you know, weekends and workshops and seminars. And they want answers, they want crystal clear answers in the sense, what do I have to do to change my life? Well, to change your life, you have to die practically in the sense what the sorcerers know as, as leaving the ego, which is a death in itself. In order to accomplish that, it's not that you really die. It, it, it's a lifetime endeavor. You see, we have no clear answers. People want a program. They would like to, okay, step one, two, and three, and then four, five follows. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way at all. It is an extremely difficult proposition to get across, but it's, it's, it's a way of life. It's not just something that you do in your free time. Your total life is involved in this body, mind, and spirit, or whatever we want to divide it. So many people want to join the sorcerer's world. So many people, uh, when they heard that you were going to be on the show, started coming to the local bookstore and saying, is Florinda or, or Taisha going to come to our town? They, they just have a tremendous, tremendous interest in what you do, and yet there's no way yes. the average person could even come close to doing what you do. I just returned from Mexico. In fact, I just came about an hour ago. I returned from Mexico. I was there with Carlos Castaneda, and we talked to, to several people. And it's always the same thing, you know, what, what can we do to, to join this world? Well, and, and what, why are you so different from the different sorcerers, the different lines, lineage of Nahuas? Well, Carlos is, is different in the sense that he has written these books. These books are obviously available to the public. And in the books, and I'm not saying that, you know, the book is enough follow any kind of, 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 of line, but in the books, it's very clearly stated in terms of what it involves to be in that world. People, I think, fail to see that the procedures, not the procedures, but let's say that there is, it, it's a clearly delineated path in the sense that we totally have to cut off ourselves from the world without retrieving from the world. Another point is that when people say, yeah, I want to join the sources, well, I need a t teacher, I need a guru. You had that too. Yes, of course we did have it, but it was a very solitary battle. Well, it is a very solitary battle. People always talk in terms of, well, there is a group, there is the Castaneda group. Well, there is no group. We had the hardest time for three days in Mexico that there is no group. There is a place, which Carlos calls the place of the second attention, the place of no self-pity, of no compassion, and in the sense that we cannot allow ourselves to be compassionate or, or have compassion or pity about our fellow man when we haven't changed ourselves. And there is that play, it doesn't matter whether it's in Mexico, whether it's in Los Angeles or San Francisco, that we do meet, you see. There is this place that we are then together. And p people from, let's say, the outside world, if there is such a thing that can be called, make that dichotomy, they do join us, even if it's only for a moment. The things that are involved in this is, like the first thing I tell people, they have to recapitulate their lives. It's one of the 
main, um, let's say, procedures to truly examine our life. Examine our life in such a minute detail, and it's not a psychological, let's say, analysis or investigation about ourselves. It's, exa- it's, it's, it's far from it. It's a total examination of what we are in the sense of how we have learned since by the time we are three or four years old to how to manipulate the world and our fellow human beings. And it becomes very clear how we have learned those patterns. And what we want to do, we want to divest ourselves of those patterns. If we cannot divest ourselves of those patterns, at least have a momentary second or I guess a momentary chance to not react the same way we react. According to Don Juan, they say our energy, let's say 90% of our energy is involved in the presentation of the self. Because of that, nothing of what is out there really can come to us. We are so filled with how we look to others, how we come across, how it, either just physically or emotionally, that idea of the presentation of the self takes all our energy, all our endeavor. We, we are, it's like we, we are already booked. We are close to anything that come, can come in. Of course, we have glimpses, which we immediately discard. Oh, well, something happened. I was whatever. Either it's in dreams or in real, in the everyday life of, 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 you know, of, of, of being awake. In this recapitulation, um, I have... I think it was in Taisha's book, or maybe Taisha said it, that you have to recapitulate every person that you have ever encountered in your life. So the, the way you want, to, I put it in Taisha, Taisha's book, is basically, it, is, it deals with the recapitulation. My problem is, as a, a job, what I do for a living as a physician, I've encountered over 500,000 people in my last 20 years. <laughs> I can't recapitulate the people I saw yesterday, let alone uh, the 100,000th person I saw in 1975. Oh, no, but you see, instead of saying that, you could say, well, you could certainly make an attempt because, as you say, in the, the kind of job that you have, let's say I'm sure you have already a, a, a very standard and very well-worked-out routine of what works in, in your line of work. Indeed. I mean, it, it has to be, otherwise you wouldn't be able to survive. So that, 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 that is your public persona. In your, let's say, in your private life, how you deal with your fellow human beings, whether it's with your wife, with your parents, with your with, with children, I don't know what, what, in terms of how you are engaged in the world. But you see the certain patterns that are recurrent, the way we interact with our fellow men, which is always to protect the ego. We're always trying to protect the ego. If it gets attacked or in any way threatened, we immediately have this, 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 let's say this background of, of ways of immediately repairing the damage, which is emotionally is all right for us, but it's not all right for the body, you see. The body acknowledges those blows. According to Don Juan, he said, illness and disease didn't really exist in his world because it is basically, it's not, I don't want to say it's self-inflicted because that, that's going too far, but we do make ourselves sick with stress, and the stress basically comes because our ego cannot deal with the world outside. All of these uh, things that the ego does to maintain itself, its self-importance, yes. are, are energy drains. Am I not correct? Totally energy drains. So for Don Juan, sorcery was a world of energy. Basically, a sorcerer is interested in visualizing or seeing energy, not visualizing, of, of apprehending, of perceiving energy directly. And we're born with that power. We have enough energy when we're born. All of us, no matter what we are, all of us have that inherent. We are perceptors. We are fields of energy. And we squander that energy exactly. by maintaining the self-importance, the self-image. This idea of the self, the idea of our self-image, whatever that, whatever that entails. And we can recapture that energy by recapitulating our lives as best as possible. It, it, there's no guarantee. You see, no. This is just one procedure to at least make us stop for a moment before we want to repeat our habitual behavior in terms of our present, the presentation of the self. Let's say, and it's very clear, for, 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 let's say, if we are in the world, in a job, somebody insults us and says, look, you didn't really do a good job. You see, emotionally, or say, let's say, psychically, we can say, oh, well, he, the asshole, doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, you know. I really know what I'm doing. And it doesn't really matter. I don't get insulted. But the body acknowledges that blow, you see, especially our energetic body. And that's exactly what Don Juan was interested in, that it doesn't happen. No matter how the world bangs you, it doesn't really matter. Because they're only banging an idea of, <laughs> of yourself anyway. Is there any particular portion of the body where we store these energy blows? Well, it depends on what, whatever. Usually, we store those energy blows in our, our, our weakest, let's say our weakest, weakest part. It, it, whether it's on our organs, or I mean, it, it depends. For instance, if you if if you under stress, let's say you feel certain pains, or you feel 
strain, you get a cold. I mean, you know your body better than anyone else. Well, that's exactly where the blow is going. But it's not universal. It isn't in the nervous system or in the tendons or in the vascular system. It, is, it varies from person to person. It varies from person to person. Like, for instance, I have very weak bronchitis. <laughs> Whenever I get drained, I start coughing very, very badly. So whether it's sometimes something, just something physically or I really got stressed out, you know, I start coughing. Of course, in Los Angeles, it's very easy because with the smog. <laughs> sure. Well, in the sorcerer's world, um, from each thing I've read, whether it's Carlos's book or your book or Taisha's book or from hearing you talk, it seems that you were lent energy by the Nagual yes. or by the other witches. Say, when we were in their company, we were running. It's not that they were lending. We were running on their energy. For us to meet them, for to be in their world, which is the world of the second attention, they were lending us their energy for us to do it. Yet, for, for them to actually do it, there has to be this total abandon. One of the, 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 the interesting things is this idea, like for instance, when we give, give talks, People are extremely cautious, and of course, rightfully so. When I encountered the world of Don Juan, there was no chance to be cautious. I either jumped in or there was no game. And I'm not saying that that's the thing to do, but for us, for me, in, in my case, there was no other way. Yes, of course, I resented it. Not that I resented it, but there were, you know, there were no really doubts, but I was extremely, let's say, aberrated in, 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 in my patterns of behavior. Because from my perspective, I was the greatest thing that ever lived. I mean, the world validated my idea of the self. I grew up in South America. I had advantages just by the mere fact the way I looked. So that, and I, you know, children know how to manipulate that extremely well. I was, I was, like for instance, my, my elementary school from kindergarten until sixth grade, I was in, in Venezuelan schools. I was, there were very few blonde children. I mean, I was treated like a little goddess, and I believed that that was my inherent right. You see, and then of course, as, a, as an adult, we do change, we alter these patterns, but there inherently is this self-importance, you know, I'm the greatest thing that ever lived. There are people in society um, taking the opposite viewpoint who... Yeah, but you see what I'm saying, they're taking the opposite view, I'm, I'm, I'm ex ex it, it, it telling you it is in a very exaggerated manner. It doesn't really matter whether our idea of ourselves is positive or negative. Okay. The drain of energy is exactly the same. Whether we maintain we have a total low self-image or a bombastic idea of the self, it doesn't really matter. The drain of energy is the same. Because we still have this idea, we have to defend this idea of what we truly are, which is decided by our fellow men. Inherently, there's nothing to really back it up. We know certain things. Yes, we know that we, we are to a degree intelligent. We know how to do certain things. Yes, but I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about basically our involvement with the self. This idea that we are all special in one way. We're always special. You see, what Don Juan did with us, he bombarded this idea of being special. He said, if you're all specials in the world, I mean, the world can function, which is absolutely true. That's why we have, let's say, from an... Yes, from a basic human point of view, we don't really know how to interact with each other because we're each, each one of us always defending something. How can we stop this? I mean, we can re recapitulate, but I've, in my own life, let me just give an example because I'm sure this would be for everybody else. Um, recapitulation takes time, and uh, it seems like the sorcerer's world is a world of people who have lots of free time. They have nothing better to do. Than nothing's calling on them to do something else. They can go off and dream for nine days or disappear from the world for ten years or whatever they want. But the average person with a job, a family... Uh, I, I totally agree with you. ...tries to recapitulate, and they might get a half hour's worth in if they're lucky, and they might uh, take two lifetimes at that rate to recapitulate anything. But, precisely. But, like, for instance, look, I've been in the sorcerer's world. I mean, I don't, I don't want to even mention it's way over 20 years, okay? But that, that is the lifetime. The thing is, my lifetime has been spent in following that path. I have made that decision to, that's all I do. There are people in our world that work jobs from, what, nine to five or whatever, six, whatever the, the, the hours are. They have totally ordinary jobs. On one level, I, have a very, I, I translate. I love to do translations. I translate things from Spanish into, into English or vice versa into in German. So that's my income. I need to live. But, and I'm certainly in the world in the sense that I do, I mean, I, I, I go, I mean, I, we are not, we have not retrieved from the world, but we are not in the world in the sense that whatever makes us react like our fellow men, we have curtailed this to the minimum. 
it doesn't really matter what they do to us anymore, how they bang us. It is not because we have succeeded in something. No, we are fighting this on a daily basis. Like people that have a family, I was just talking, I mean, in Mexico there was this, 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 this man, he has five children, he has a, a wife, a lovely woman, and she is, of course, totally threatened by his interest in, in the world of sorcerers, in the world of Don Juan. And I said, no, but this is totally absurd, because whatever he can get out of it, even by just recapitulating, if he really does it properly and is truly sincerely interested, his life as a father and a husband has to get better. But the mere fact that he is changing will force you to change. Because especially in a relationship of, of husband and wife, the only thing is, well, he has to do, if I'm going to put this and this and this, and I'm going to change, he has to do it. In the world of sorcery, it doesn't work that way. You change for the hell of it. What the other person does is none of your concern. Your change of behavior will force the other person, whether they want to or not, to change. I can tell you this with utter sincerity, because that's exactly what happens in our world. I used to complain endlessly. Well, she is not doing her job. He is not doing her job. I'm trying to change. I'm doing this. You see, the I, I, I never stops. Indeed. And then, what the one said, you know, he said, you're full of prunes. He said, you give everyone that you deal with a blank check. Whatever they do to you, short of killing you and injuring you, has nothing to do with you. You change for the hell of it. And sure enough, he's right. If we change, the I changes, you force the world around you to change. And that's my contention, this idea, whether we are interested in it from, eco from an ecological point of view, from a psychological point of view, whatever we're trying to do in the world, we are not willing to change ourselves. We try to implement change in others without changing ourselves. Or changing ourselves only, we say that we have changed. In the body, the energetic body knows when someone hasn't changed, when it's not quite sincere or quite right. Yes, that they're struggling, I agree, but the change has, it, it's a very, we have to change ourselves as a person in order to affect the world around us without expecting them to change. Our guest today on the Earth Mystery Show here on KVMR 89.5 FM is Florinda Donner. Florinda has been in the world of uh, sorcery for the last 20 years, if you just tuned in. She's written several books. Her latest, Being and Dreaming, is available in bookstores. And she's also wit written The Witch's Dream and Shabono. Speaking of change, you mentioned um, in Arizona at the Rim Institute when I first heard you that, um, that men have more or less screwed up the world, and it's up to women to uh, dream us a new world and change. Could you talk a little bit about the role of women? No, no, no. I did not say that it's up to women. No, no, no. Women cannot do it by themselves. You see, I think either I'm, I'm, I'm not coming across right or I'm, I'm, I don't want to say I'm being mis misinterpreted because that's totally absurd. No. What I'm saying is, yes, let's say the masculine principle has, let's say, taken us to where we are now. What I'm saying is that women have a great deal to contribute. What we contribute, let's say, in the world of everyday life is not that different from what men have been doing. Yes, women have advanced enormously by the pressure they have been put, let's say, on the masculine, masculine frame. But we, we copy your paradigm. The paradigm, let's say, that rules us, no matter in what aspect of life, it's a masculine paradigm. We are basically a, a male universe. When the universe, according to the sorcerers, the universe is basically a, f a feminine universe. And it's almost like it has been reversed in the sense whatever rules us is only the male principle. What I'm saying is that this, it, has, it has to be balanced, and it cannot be balanced by asking, let's say, the male, and I'm talking in the actual, I'm not talking about males, any male in particular, it has to change. Because if you truly, if you just look around you, we have truly screwed up the planet. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Our whole institutions are, are, are just pr pretty much sick. I agree, but I, I also, maybe I misinterpreted what you said in Arizona, but I also felt that you were calling on the women to, um, to stop being slaves, to stop accepting the paradigm of a male universe when it's really a basically female universe, and start dreaming what the universe should be for us. Well, what it should be, that there's no way, like, for instance, like, well, what should it be? Like, for instance, for us to survive as a species, we have to evolve. You see, we have to evolve, and I don't mean evolve in idealities. The idealities that, that rule us have been exhausted. We only come up with a different version of what has been going on for the last 5,000 years. We haven't really done anything new. It, I think, I don't know whether I mentioned this, this idea of we have to intend something new. 
what we cannot intend what it is, what it's going to be, the new thing, except it has to be some change. For instance, the dinosaurs, they intended flight. They didn't intend wings. The wings were the byproduct of that intent. The same it is with us. And the women have, let's say, the biological constitution to evolve. That's, that's the only thing, what I've said. But for women to do that, they have to be given the time and protection from the males. They need that time to be ruled, not just look no matter what, in, in, uh, what, what let's, say, let's say how, how sensitive and how in you as, 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 a, as a human being, let's say in, in your relationship with, with, with your family. That is not enough for, to make a difference. There are pockets, let's say, of groups that, yes, the male is totally in, let's say, in agreement that something has to change. They are willing, let's say, to, to give the female or the, 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 the women the, the, whatever the time, or let's say, the, yes, you are in charge. But I'm not saying in terms of that you are in charge. That, again, is almost like a masculine terminology. No one is in charge. It has to be a joint process of trying to change. And that change can only come by changing ourselves. The, the emphasis on the I, on the ego, has to go. One of, I think one of the reasons that we are so enthralled with the idea of the self, because we have really nothing else to protect. It's like, let's say, in primitive man, prehistoric man, the idea of the cave. It's almost like a territoriality. We are treating the ego as a territory because we don't have nothing to, we don't defend the cave anymore. That's already been taken care of. So we defend by, in the most exorbitant manner, at an exorbitant price, the idea of the self. And if that goes, something, something will happen. I know because it happens to the sorcerers. See, you mentioned the intending, and the word intent is used all through uh, Carlos Castaneda's books, and it's in your book. And that's something um, that is difficult, I think, for the average person to understand. Very difficult for us to understand, too. It, it is, because it is extremely subtle, extremely powerful, and yet it is not as... The intent speaks, let's say, directly to the energy body. We all have an energy body. And we voice our intent... And yet it is not voiced as a psychological process. And yet it, it, it sounds, you see, it's very difficult. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, it, this is so esoteric or so abstract. It's not. It's so simple. But I think it's own simplicity that makes it so, so hard to grasp. And that, again, is, it's, I'm talking, I mean, it, it sounds like, you know. I'm <laughs> well, let me see if I can say it the way I understand it. And that is that intent is a spirit. It's an energy that pervades the universe. And that spirit or that energy is benevolent. It wishes us well, and it throws things in our face every day, every night, all the time, which are for our own good. And we as energy beings or as, as egos um, ignore it, look by it, pay attention to our, our own ego, our own life, and ignore what the intent of the universe is. Yes, but intent, okay, I want to go, I want to correct only one thing, this idea that it is benevolent. No, it is only energy. It's neither good or bad, it is energy. We make that interpretation, you see. Energy is energy. It's like something that's out there in the universe, creating the universe. I mean, yes, let's say, let's say from, from the, almost from an, astronom from, from an astronomy point of view. I use the word benevolent just because so many people are afraid of the word sorcery. They assume sorcery has something to do with evil. Sorcery, of course, carries a horrendous load of what, when the New World was discovered by the Spaniards, you had totally, was a Catholic view which the idea of good and evil is so prevalent that it was impossible for them to understand any, anything else. So that, that whatever was destroyed in terms of a system of knowledge was so gigantic. You know, like, for instance, in Yucatan, you know, you have, of course, you, you, you know about the, all the, the, the Spanish, like the, the, the clergy, the Sahagun and, and Diego de Landa, and whatever they have done in the New World was so gigantically negative in a sense. They burned, the, 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 the Mayas in the Yucatan, they had, a li had libraries that Diego de Landa burned. It took four months of daily burning to, to burn all the manuscripts. I mean, that's inconceivable in terms of the kind of knowledge that was lost. That had nothing to do with our Western point of view. Well, there are, um, there are still people like uh, you and uh, your, your party who try and preserve small bits of this knowledge and who write books and bring some of this knowledge back to us, but there are obviously, as you said, four months worth of books that were burned that nobody's going to ever see again. Okay. Is it your intention and, and your party's intention to put all the stuff into print so that the average person can read it and, uh, and learn it and do it? 
No, but, well, our intent is that the reading is basically, I mean, our whatever we have written is extremely personal in the sense that is exactly ha what has happened to us. In terms of what we know from the sorcerers of, of the lineage of Don Juan, it's only one line what we know, you see. I am sure there are many other systems of knowledge that is expressed, let's say, the terminology, the vocabulary is different, but ultimately the intent is the same. It is not that different of systems of knowledge. This system of knowledge is extremely pragmatic. It truly gives us a, the way, <laughs> if you're interested, to follow certain, I don't want to say rules and regulations because there are none, but it does give us a very pragmatic way of trying to implement something that in other traditions we can only read about. Rituals, exercises, yes, they are fine only to hook our attention, but ultimately the only thing that counts from our experience is that inherent change. We truly want to do it with no recompense in sight. There is nothing that guarantees us that we are going to make it. There's nothing in that, you know, I emphasize this again and again, people that are interested, I cannot guarantee you that whatever the work you put into it is going, you're going to be successful. I don't know it myself. If, I have, if I'm going to succeed the way Don Juan succeeded, if that was success, anyway. But at least the path, whatever we're trying to do or whatever we are doing, is infinitely more exciting to us and if I would follow my parents' path, and I'm not criticizing my parents, I love my parents dearly, I'm not criticizing, I'm just, I would like my life to end differently, and I know the way their life is going to end. Let me take a minute to tell the listeners that you're listening to KVMR 89.5 FM, and our guest today is Florinda Donner. She's written her latest book, Being and Dreaming, an Initiation into the Sorcerer's World, and she's also written The Witch's Dream and Shabono. Speaking of your parents, all of you have had to die to the world in one sense or another to become sorcerers. Yes. Carol Tigg said that she was in a different place, a different world for 10 years. Um, what relation do you have with your past family? Well, with my past family, actually, I think I'm the only one that has any kind of relationship with, with, with the family because of my circumstances. When I first entered, if, if there is such a thing, I mean, I entered into the sorcerer's world, I packed myself off purposefully from most people that I knew, including my parents, of course. My parents did not know for about 10, 12 years whether I was dead or alive. Um, it was a very a calculated move because from a social point of view, is for us to change, for us to be able to change, we need to cut off ourselves from the people that know us so well because not that they do it maliciously, but they prevent us from changing because they already know what we are and nothing that we do will make them change their mind. And I'm not talking about in terms of, okay, you're not capable of doing certain things. No, I'm talking about a fundamental change in our energy. They're going to reinforce your self-image that, that they knew before you changed. And then, and then I remember Florinda one time said, look, it doesn't matter. Why don't you just go and see your parents? And at that time, you know, I had been working, you know, I was doing, as an anthropologist, I had actually I was in contact with one brother, and from time to time I would let him know. I just wanted to at least reassure assure them that I was not dead. I said I was involved in something that I had to cut myself off. Personally, I had parents that were extremely understanding. And it, let's say, from at least from my perspective, it went very well. When I, let's say, reestablished contact with my parents, it was extremely interesting to see that my relationship with my parents was much more loving and understanding than it had been, ever been before. Well, you mentioned seeing, and to a sorcerer, or a, a sorcerer being a person who can change his perceptions uh, at will, sorcerers see, I gather, the human as a luminous egg of energy fibers, and within that uh, luminous egg there's a, a place you call the assembly point where we perceive, and if you should shift that assembly point, you perceive things totally differently, you're in a different world. And, and I assume that when we dream, the assemblage point is shifting a little bit, and that's why we perceive dreams. Okay. But you're able to dream awake. You're able to dream consciously, and the dream world seems, from your books and what I've heard, to be very, very real, realer than it is to most of us. It, it, okay, let's say, let's say the, the, one of the, let's say not, not the ultimate, but like for instance, one of the, the, the greatest accomplishments of, this, of, a, of a bona fide sorcerer is that the world of, the second attention, the world of dreaming awake, of dreaming, uh, as in, 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 in Castaneda's latest book, has to do that you want the same control as you have in the world of everyday life you have in the world of dreams. And I'm talking about 
dreams in the sense that it is like some kind of psychological, let's say our ordinary dreams are based, you see Don Juan was never interested in the contents of our dream. He was interested in the control of the assemblage point. As you said, the, the assemblage point moves, shifts naturally, it vibrates in dreams. It crosses into new energy bands, thus new worlds are being, let's say, they're not constructed. We enter into other, into different layers of the onion. The sorcerer wants to maintain that assemblage point long enough, and that's what basically refers to what stalking is, that you can fix the assemblage point in a new position for as long as you wish. And that's where the control of the assemblage point goes in. Because you do assemble new worlds, and you live in that world as you live in this world. For instance, the world of Don Juan, the world of the sorcerers of, of Don Juan's group, was the world of the second attention. They were perennially in the world of the second attention. The question arises, I'm sure you've been asked this many times, what is the difference between the world of the second attention, or dreaming awake, and lucid dreaming, which many people experience routinely? Well, the world of the second attention is a bona fide world. I think lucid dreamers do enter that world of the second attention, but not long enough. They cannot sustain it, because we all, as, as you, you've already said before, we all have the inherent capacity to do this way. The sorcerer extends that capacity and totally dominates it in the sense that he manipulates that world the way he manipulates the world of everyday life. He is master in the sense of how he enters or exits from that world. Whereas a dreamer, a lucid dreamer, does it, it, it's chance. You see, and then whether we are in, in usually it's some kind of psychological trauma would bring us into that world, hunger, drugs, alcohol, I think the emphasis of our societies with, let's say, the, the, the fixation on drugs is basically that they know that there is something out there that they want. You see, that, that they, energetically they know that whatever this world is, is not enough. So they try to do it artificially. And of course, by that they have cut everything off because they can erase the world of everyday life or whatever their concerns with the world of everyday life by either taking a drug or smoking marijuana or hashish. I mean, it's, it's incredible what, what we consume. Now we make it, of course, totally legal, and people are into, you know, pharmaceuticals, legal drugs, you know, which is as deleterious as anything else. To enter the second attention, one has to acquire enough energy. But I mentioned this earlier. You borrowed the energy, or it was given to you by the witches or the sorcerers, and the average person doesn't have that benefit. Nobody's going to um, give them an energy boost to the point where they can shift their assemblage point. But the energy boost was also, like, it, it, let's say, when I encountered the world of Don Juan, it wasn't, of course, I entered their world, but I had to do my part. Because if I did not, and that had to do in terms of, because I had their examples in front of us. Okay, when, let's say when we go out in the world and we give lectures, basically, the audience is, extremely, well, I wouldn't know, I mean, it's not, because I've never had that, that encounter. The audience is extremely, let's say... Interested. Interested, and at the same time, very disbelieving. And, and quite, and very often discontent, because of fact, what I mentioned was, you had, you had Don Juan, you had the old Florinda, you had this and this and this. Well, so what? At the moment, all you have got is me in front of you, or Carlos or Tasha, or Carol Tiggs. And I'm not saying that I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that we are, in fact, I, I, I reiterate that over and over again, we do not have the facility or the power that Don Juan and his group had to truly force you into that world. But we certainly are presenting the procedures of doing it because in terms of, yes, we were there with Don Juan, but then we had to do the work. And look, it took us 30 years to do what we're trying to do, or at least ourselves coherent enough and present something to the world. And I think that's, again, the difference between males and females. The male talks about this process. Look, look, Carlos Castaneda's books are a witness to that. He talked about the process from the very beginning. It was the well, the, the three of us, the women, after living in this world for over 20 years, we can finally can talk about the process because we have totally embodied it. And, and that's one of the basic differences between being, I think, between male and female. And that's what Don Juan said again, and I repeat this over and again. I had a lot of males extremely angry at us because suddenly, you know, the thought was, well, this is just a world of females. It is not a world of females. Neither is it a world of males. 
it is a total, it is also integral because it has such a psychological uh, load to it. But it is a harmonious world in the sense that they are, there's no one is more than someone else. The only thing that counts in our world is energy. That the Nagual is a male is because of this energy configuration and also because as females, Don Juan always said whether you're in the world of sorcerers or in the world of the everyday life, you are wackos. You need the sobriety of the male in order to function properly. And from the feminist point of view, this was one of the most difficult things for me to totally accept. And I'm not accepting this in terms of, well, as defeat, but as, as a statement of fact. We do need the world of, of, of the male to make this world sober. And I can see over and over again, I talk a lot to a lot of women, to friends of small groups of women, and believe me, when we all get together, it is so easy to get out of control. Everybody is thinking we're having a great time. No, it's a lack of control. It's a, not a control, it's a lack of sobriety. That the male principle, whatever it is, brings to the world, whether it's to the world of everyday life or to the world of the sorcery, it brings that sobriety, which is necessary no matter where we are acting. The word sobriety, um, could we use the word responsibility or sense of responsibility in place of sobriety? It, it, let's say, no, 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 I'm specifically using sobriety. It's a sobriety. I, I know you're using the word, but to most people that implies not being drunk. Struck. Pardon me? Oh, the drunk also, oh, yes, oh, yeah, it has that connotation. No, 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 I don't think. <laughs> Males drink more than females, I think. No, no, I don't, I mean, it has nothing to do. No, it's, it's, yeah, sober means, yeah, not being drunk also, yeah. It, it just means, uh, to me, it means a responsibility or some, some inner drive to be responsible and together. I know, you're not no, I, I don't want to use responsible at all. No, 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 it is, it is some, it's like some kind of coherence. Sobriety in the abstract, it's, it's, yeah, it's sobriety, yeah, there's, no, no, it's, I think we have bastardized the words with alcoholism, but yeah, I want to go to a, the original meaning of sobriety. <laughs> okay. Well, this whole world is so fascinating and so interesting. I certainly wouldn't um, argue with you that it exists or not. I'm, I'm a fully, full believer in it. Um, I, like many of the listeners, would like to have uh, some way of, of entering it. But obviously, in my world, I have no no energy to dream the way you dream, and no, 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 not likely to acquire it. You have the, no, no, no. The thing is, you see, you don't want to retreat from the world to follow, let's say, the exercises or to follow something that whatever you think we are doing. No. In your daily world, you can become, what is, what is your, 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 your job, the description? Of, I'm a physician. A physician. And, but what, what you do in the radio, what, what, is, what, is, what is it called when you do a radio, when you, when you work in the, for the radio? I mean, this is called self-amusement. Self-amusement, okay. As a self-amuser, you can become a sorcerer in self-amusement. As a self, as you see, whatever you do, you do your job or whatever you're doing, you make an art out of it. And that's basically what we are interested in. But that's what sorcery is. You make it into an art, whether you do it through recapitulating your life by, by trying to stop the involvement with the self. Believe me, that is all it takes for the world to open. I love the concept of controlled folly. I've, ever since I read that, uh, I've, I've thought of so many times where, where life really is controlled folly. Exactly. But the, um, the, the wild, imaginative um, world of being and dreaming is what I think many of us would love to enter, even for a time, like going to the movies. I know you like movies, but to be able to, um, let's say, go to another world, the world of the inorganic being, something like that, and return and just even remember it for one time, other than going to sleep at, at night and dreaming and forgetting it all. <laughs> but you see, that sounds because the, 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 the work, let's say, is presented in, 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 in such a light, because that, that, let's say, that's my predilection and my delight. But the idea of entering into the world of dreaming, you see, and that's exactly what I have talked in my lecture. You see, it would be interesting to do this for a while and then return to the world of everyday life. Well, it's not possible. You see, it, I can talk about uh, the world of the inorganic beings. I can talk about the world of, of the sorcerers in Mexico. You see, for me, this world doesn't stop. It's real. I am in that world, even as I talk to you now. For other people, it could be just like a mo it's a holiday and then life continues. Well, for us, it doesn't continue. The horror exists because in a weird way, this is a horrifying world. When you say continue, I was very curious um, that your group is the last of a long line of Toltec sorcerers. Is there going to be any continuation or are you the last of it? Is this the end? When Juan told, told Carlos that he was the last of his line. That's the last we, 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 we knew from, from, from Don Juan. 
then your intent when you talk to me on the radio or talk to groups of people is t what? My intent that we are going, let's say, we are going, like somebody in Mexico said, well, what, 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 what's the matter with you now? Why are you going public now, quote? I said, we're going public because we want to, let's say, gather. And that's the wrong word because it means like that we're looking for disciples. We are not. We want to at least, let's say, create a critical mass. If a critical mass exists in any kind of endeavor, some, some kind of change will ensue. We need a critical mass of interested parties that at least take us seriously. And I don't mean seriously as a hobby. I mean seriously as a profound change. Let's say you have a critical mass of people who are recapitulating their lives. They're trying to uh, decrease their self self-importance, self their ego. Yes. They're doing uh, sorcerer's passes, which we haven't discussed, but and it moves to increase personal energy. Let's say you get a group of those people. Will you be able to tap the energy from those people for your own purposes? If nothing, look, you, are you married? Yes, indeed. Children? Four. Pardon me? Four children. Four children. If you take me seriously, I can guarantee you your life and the life of your family changes. I've, I've noticed um, just from doing the sorcerer's passes and, and thinking about intent, you know, phenomenal things happen. In what degree that change only you can decide, you see? That's what I'm saying, this idea of a guru, of someone taking you by the hand. It's no, I'm, but I'm asking specifically, when you get a group of people, a critical mass, will you use their energy? You, I mean, you, the, the sorcerer's group, not you personally. Of course. In, I mean, in energy in abundance, we cannot use your energy. No, I could only use your energy if you're... If you, let's say, if you have divested yourself of the ego. That's the energy we want. Because that's the energy that is going to open your parameters of perception. That's going to blast you out of your, your, your idea of the self. It's only energy, not what I say or what I do. You have, you see, you have to join me. Indeed. And that's what we want. That's why we are going public. Where are Don Juan and uh, Don Hanaro right now? Well, we, I don't think, I'm already, I'm not already people, you know. I have already, let's say, I have talked about it already, and it doesn't get across quite properly. Um, they have made the jump into the inconceivable. They have jumped, in terms of, if, if we want to put it in any kind of physical sense, let's say they have made the leap into the unknown. What is ultimately unknown? Are they stuck in the world of the inorganic beings? We think yes. So, did Don Juan finally make it in his group? In a weird way, that's a, 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 it, 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 let's say it's a world of, of, of prisoners as the world of our world of everyday life is. It's another system. Well, the reason I asked you about the energy of, of us, people listening to you, people who might be trying to increase the energy level, is could you use our energy to rescue Don Juan from the world of inorganic beings as you rescued Carlos from that world? No, I don't, we, we don't really know. On one, I think at one time, I think the misunderstanding comes because I thought, yes, Let's say if we have a, a, enough energy, as we leap to pull them out of it, but that's almost like a metaphor. You see, there is—I don't really know what I'm in, in terms of how can you see. We don't have the lexicon to truly describe even the world of in, uh, inorganic beings. We describe that world as metaphors, although they're not metaphorical, or as as something that is already known to us because we don't have the language to describe something that is unknown to us. It can only be described in something that is known. So it, yes, it. On one level, yes, if we have enough energy, we could, as we leap, and whatever that means, that leap, it, it, you have to, let's say, formulate. As a physicist, you probably know. What I'm thinking is that, um, that, as I mentioned earlier in this talk or the interview, that intent throws itself at us all the time in unknown ways. This is a camouflage universe. It's a universe of energy, but it's camouflaged as whatever we perceive it as. But every once in a while, there are... There are cracks in the screen. There's a tear in the screen that lets us know that this this camouflage isn't really real. Yes, precisely. And those those bits of intent or bits of energy or whatever you want to call it in the dream world would you would call them scouts. Yes. That if you can hook onto that scout, it will take you to another world, to the world where that scout is coming from. Oh, precisely. How can the average person, just listening to this talk on the radio right now, how can that person? see, feel, perceive when an event is something that intent is throwing in their face to hook onto and not let it slip by. You need energy for that. 
you see, it's the same thing. If you are divested of the idea of the self, that's, you know, like, just, just yesterday I was talking to those people next to you. It was exactly, I mean, almost word by word, exactly the same question. And I said, well, that's premature. That you see, they're all interested in the world, you know, get, jumping into the second attention, meeting the inorganic beings. But it's absurd to talk about that stage if they have not divested themselves of their idea of the self. You see, that's what I'm talking. The most important step for us is this idea of losing self-importance, of reducing that ego to nothing. We're never going to lose it all, although it is possible. As, from my perspective, Castaneda is totally egoless. He's so empty that it's scary to be with him. It's frightening. I can understand. At the same time, it's the most addictive, let's say, substance there is. A person that has no ego. It's, it's, it's a total addiction. Isn't human life, the ego in human life, the addiction that we're all addicted to? Yes, ultimately, yes. I think so. You're listening. I mean, the listeners that are listening to this stuff are um, are very sophisticated. They've heard lots of stuff, and you said the same question comes up to you all the time. And hopefully this talk, this interview, has been trying to give you the questions that you hear every time because that's what interests all of us, and that's what everybody wants to know. And it boils down to um, you have to get rid of this self-importance, this ego, which is a lesson from religions all around the world. They all say the same thing. But in practical steps, if I'm understanding the world of sorcery, the way we go, go about doing that is to recapitulate our lives, exactly. go through everything, every event that we can remember, and try and see the patterns that we've been addicted to and recapture the energy from those patterns. Then if we have done that successfully, we, ha we will have enough energy to see intent when it throws itself in our face or to grab hold of one of these scouts in a dream. Precisely. In a dream or in, in our waking life. It happens to us all the time. So Carlos described in his book, I think it's the cubic centimeter of chance that pops out at the most incredible moment. And if you have the energy to grab it, you, you go for it. For me, even like for instance, entering, let's say, the world of sorcerers, it was a, a, a decision of a millisecond that, yes, I'm going to go with that woman. I'm going to take her with me. I'm going to give her a ride. You see, if I can, re, if, if I take the time to re-examine certain moments, crucial moments in my life, I had, let's say, the chances of having done the wrong decision or of taking the wrong path were so innumerable, it scares me to death. Just to think about it, it gives me a headache. Because it is, it's such a minute decision. You think at the moment it's nothing, but it's monumental. And that's what I, this idea of, you know, intent, something talks to us directly. And usually we are so concerned with whatever the concerns of the world to, to, to notice. I still, as a human, don't understand how we get rid of the concerns of the world. I mean, if you, if you didn't go with that woman, or if, let's say, let's say in my life, let's say someone came in in one hour and said, would you go with me to Mexico? I would like you to start in this new life. I would have every thought in the world of what about my children, what about my wife, what about my employees? It would go on and on. It would never stop talking like that in my head. And yet that chance might be the one chance you're talking about that never comes again. It's not going to be like this. Why don't you come with me to Mexico? I don't think it has nothing to do with that. For instance, in, in my particular case, it had nothing to do with what It was a matter of, can you give me a ride to Hermosillo? Or something like that. Or, you know, I can put you in contact with someone. It, it, it is not that delineated. Those, those moments don't come like this. Okay, come with me to Mexico. I'm going to introduce you to the world of sorcery. No, it's not going to be. It's never going to come like that. No. Look, even the idea of it, you, only you have, let's say, the, the power, the facility to truly make something different of yourself and of your life. And no one ultimately is going to help you with that. But one ultimately didn't help us in the sense we had to do it ourselves. And I'm not trying to belittle the, the importance of those people. I'm just trying to, to stress the amount of work and dedication that is involved with something like that. Willpower, sheer willpower and total abandon that ultimately you don't give a damn what happens to you, you see? And of course, as a person that is totally alone, with no responsibilities, it's a much easier step to take. But you already have your responsibility in front of you. You can make your children's life and your, and your wife's life a work of art. The mere fact that you, and I'm not talking from a moralistic point of view or a religious point of view, I'm talking from an energetic point of view, for you to wish and do everything in your power to make it the best for them, and I don't, I don't even mean in terms of giving them the life they are accustomed to. No, I mean from an energetic point of view, 
that in itself is so liberating, it will flip you into another universe. You see, the idea of that there is another universe is right next to us. It's a matter of perception. It has nothing that suddenly you will be taking in the world of the inorganic beings. You will be taking into the second attention. I live in the second attention as I talk to you. It's the prison. The way I'm looking through the world has been changed through energy. Well, I'm hoping that you'll accept an invitation to come to our area. There was so much excitement about uh, you being on the radio today that I know that... Um, if we could get you to come to Nevada City, there would be even more excitement in person for people to be able to talk to you as we've talked today. Are you in Nevada City? Yes. Where is Nevada City? Um, it's northeast of Sacramento, toward Lake Tahoe, off Route 80. But well, for a moment I was in, talking in, to the state of Nevada. No, Nevada City's in California, and your your friend Randy lives up here, or is up here. Well, did you know Randy Fuller? He called me this morning. Oh, he called you. Yeah, he called and left a message in my machine. So and I know he has invited you, so I'm going to invite you for the sake of our radio audience and for myself to come here. Yeah, I definitely know. We, we, I think we will come as we came to the RIM Institute. We'd be very happy to set it up for you. Have, and have a weekend, a, a weekend session, and we go definitely into them. I want to bring the Chuck Malls. There are two big Chuck Malls and two little Chuck Malls, and we definitely want to blast the hell out of you. Well, <laughs> no, I mean it because I'm going to take that as a promise. <laughs> It is a promise. Thank you. Thank you. Florinda, it's been so nice having you on the air, and um, we feel honored. Thank you again. And I hope we'll see us.